Well, it was an interview with the executive director of the New York Times. In any event, he makes the following comment in an interview concerning the failed predictions of the New York Times and their failure to call the election right and having been so out of tune, out of harmony with middle America. Uh, and the implications of that for both the election and also the reputation of the New York Times, which is under fire for Mr. Trump for editorializing the news instead of reporting it, being simply a media outlet, a propaganda piece, if you will, for the Democratic Party, as most of the mainstream media is. In other words, they are editorial, editorializing the news instead of reporting it. They're not actually journalists, they're commentators pretending to be journalists who are framing the news along the lines of their own biases and trying to present that as objective fact. And that's the accusation against the Times. In response to these things and to the uh, mud that they were left trying to clean from their face after they called the election wrong, Mr. David McQuay says this, I want to make sure that we set up to cover that. I want to make sure we are much more creative about beats out in the country so we understand that anger and disconnectedness that people feel. And I think I use religion as an example because I was raised Catholic in New Orleans. Now, Southern Louisiana is the only major area of the American South that is Roman Catholic. Most of the American South is Protestant, a fair percentage of that evangelical in both black and white communities. But Southern Louisiana would be the exception. It would be a Catholic area going back, of course, to the uh, even to the 18th as well as early 19th centuries. He says this coming from that kind of New Orleans Catholic background. I think that the New York-based and Washington-based media powerhouses also probably don't quite get religion. We have a fabulous religion writer, but she's all alone, probably referring to the religious affairs editor of the New York Times. We don't get religion. We don't get the role of religion in people's lives. And I think we can do much, much better. And I think there are things that we can be more creative about to understand the country. Let's begin by looking at what he means by religion. By religion, he undoubtedly means institutionalized religion, institutionalized religion, denominational religion in terms of Christianity or in Judaism, the American College of Rabbis or the Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Syosis, etc. Let us look at the state of religion in America. The founding fathers of the United States were theists. They plainly subscribed to the Judeo-Christian God. Now, some of them had a broader theistic or theist interpretation of it, such as Thomas Jefferson. Yet even Thomas Jefferson used federal funds to print Bibles and to put Bibles into the languages of Native American Indians. He was not anti-Judeo-Christian or anti-Scripture. Jefferson's view of separation of church and state was not the way it's been redefined by the modern court system or by the ACLU. America was reacting in its foundational documents to what had happened in Europe. But the foundational documents are themselves theistic. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are endowed by their creator. Uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are both theistic documents. They are predicated on the presupposition of the existence of God, which to the signers, founders, framers of the Constitution and signatories of the Declaration of Independence was the God of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. That was the basis of faith in America, the Judeo-Christian scriptures. There was a heritage preceding this. The first constitution in the United States was the fundamental orders of Connecticut. This was developed under the scriptural influences of Thomas Hooker, who was a committed evangelical Christian, as was Roger Williams in neighboring Rhode Island. Now, New England today is the most notorious of the liberal states. The most anti-Judeo-Christian of the states, quite arguably, are, are states like Rhode Island and, of course, Massachusetts. These, however, were at one time bastions of evangelicism. Unfortunately, going back to the foundations of America, 
as Jonathan Edwards and the English evangelist George Whitfield, who came to America, stated, the Puritans discredited evangelicism with things like the Salem witch hunts and so forth. But there were others who did not subscribe to this, among them Thomas Hooker and Roger Williams, who were keen, keen to promote the institution of democracy and democratic government based on scriptural principles and based on social justice, including for Indians. Um, and of course, by extension to slaves, although there were not many black slaves at that particular time in the northern colonies. This was the beginning of it. These influences from the fundamental orders of Connecticut, going back to the Mayflower Compact, were incorporated into the mindset that helped produce the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. There was also an indirect influence by non-monarchial British parliamentarianism, that is going back to Cromwell, where the idea was, instead of a monarch, we would be a republic, but it would be a republic where we would be governed by men who were governed by God. One of the signatories of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence stated, no matter how many laws we pass, unless there's a faith in Jesus Christ, they'll come to nothing. There was an evangelical influence in some of the founding fathers. Others, of course, were slave owners, were caught up in Freemasonry, although Freemasonry then is not exactly what it is now. It was still Freemasonry. Um, nonetheless, they all had this broad view of, of God based on the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Some of them, some of them were believers. Some were not. Um, I think John Carroll, Lewis Carroll was uh, a Catholic. He was the only Catholic signatory. When we look at these colonies, Maryland was founded by Catholics, Pennsylvania by Quakers, Massachusetts by Puritans. These are all people seeking to escape religious persecution in Great Britain that came under King James particularly. Notorious for the King James persecution is the same King James who authorized the King James Bible, but he persecuted believers. That's why the Puritans came on the, or the pilgrims as we call them, came on the Mayflower. Now, there were other colonies, such as Georgia, that were found for debtors. But again, it was the idea of social justice based on a biblical principle of Georgia. The foundations of American democracy and democratic thought were all predicated on Judeo-Christian presupposition. There was admittedly an element of hypocrisy in this in the southern colonies due to slavery that would be resolved later in time. Nonetheless, the influence was still nonetheless there. Now, even concerning slavery, which was the blood mark on, on America's early history, we have to understand that the abolitionist movement itself was born out of primarily evangelical Christianity. Slavery had first been abolished in the British Empire under the leadership of John Wesley and John Newton, the composer of Amazing Grace. That influence came to the United States and the abolitionist movement was fermented tremendously among evangelical preachers in New England and in the northern states, particularly Illinois and New York. Uh, later, the civil rights movement would come out of Christianity, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that gave rise to Dr. Martin Luther King, of course, Medgar Evers and others. These were people strongly influenced by biblical principles, as was Frederick Douglass, the first real Afro-American civil rights activist who uh, was what would be today called a conservative Republican, yet he was the first activist. We have to remember something happened. Something happened in American history that began to change things in the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was a shift. The political party of upward mobility for black Americans had always been the Republicans. Martin Luther King's father was a Republican. Martin Luther King was initially a Republican. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. That was the party of emancipation. It was the Republicans who first opposed segregation in the schools. It was Dwight Eisenhower who demanded desegregation of schools in the American South. While the leaders of Jim Crow had been the party of slavery, the Democrats, the party of the Klan, were the Democrats, absolutely. Uh, 
and they mix this with a particular blend of Southern Calvinism. God made us white, therefore we are the elect. There were similar versions of this with the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa and its apartheid, and in the plantation period in, in Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland, where the Catholics were seen as the non-elect and the Protestants saw themselves as the elect, which they thought gave them some kind of a divine license to exploit and dominate, politically exclude from political process, the Catholic population. This came to the United States in the form of first slavery and then Jim Crow, which sought to perpetuate the institution of slavery by another name. Instead of black slaves, you have them on chain gangs. Well, there was a religious dimension of this. With the Civil War, the Northern Baptists and the Northern Methodists were anti-slavery. They were abolitionists. The Southern Baptists and the Southern Methodists were at that time pro-slavery. All the way into the 1960s, you'll see people like Lester Maddox, the segregationist governor of Georgia, or George Wallace, who stood on the steps of the university in Alabama and refused to allow black students, even black veterans, trying to come to university on the GI Bill, having fought in Vietnam, he refused to let them in to the university. These were Democrats. George Favor, the mentor of Bill Clinton, a radical segregationist. Um, Senator Byrd a member of the Ku Klux Klan, a leading member of the Ku Klux Klan, who was, by her own admission, the political mentor of Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is the way it was. The father of Al Gore opposed civil rights. He was a radical segregationist. You look today, people like Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, whose church, Plains Baptist Church, remained segregated until the 1970s. To the 1970s, this church was racially segregated. Or, obviously, uh, Al Gore. These people are all Southern Democrats. They're from the party of Jim Crow and slavery. But it's Jim Crow with a smile. Jim Crow with a new name, but the same kind of policies. They always did the same thing to blacks that they do now. Uh, the Klan wanted blacks disarmed. They wanted gun control in the black communities so black people couldn't protect themselves from the Klan. Today, it's the same thing. They're trying to take guns away from honest blacks, suspend Second Amendment rights, so people will be defenseless against the drug gangs destroying their neighborhoods. It's the same party doing the same thing. Additionally, it was uh, kill as many blacks as possible. Well, today, they don't do it by lynching. They do it by allowing drugs to come in across the Mexican border, fueling gang violence in the Afro-American community. Well, what else did they do? Imprison as many blacks as possible. Well, again, the Afro-American prison population tripled under the presidency of, of Bill Clinton. Um, this is the same party doing what they always did, but there was a religious parallel to it, a religious parallel. The blacks took on this belief of liberation theology. There was a schism within the black community where the traditional, more conservative, family-based, and even evangelical influences of Afro-Americans from the Baptist and Pentecostal tradition that produced people like George Washington Carver and that produced Booker T. Washington, the black educator, now shifted to the influences of W.E.B. Du Bois, somebody who'd basically been a Marxist. So you had this blend of Christianity or Christendom and liberation theology. This has produced the likes of Jesse Jackson, it's produced the likes of Al Sharpton, and it's produced the likes of the mentor of Barack Obama, Jeremiah Wright in Chicago, whose theology and prayer was goddamn America. This is what happened. There was a shift away from traditional black conservative Protestantism and evangelicism towards this liberation theology that accompanied this shift of black America from being Republican to being Democrat. That is essentially what happened. So you wind up with a situation where progressivists see Christianity 
as a mere political tool, as long as it serves to advance the political influence of their political party, as long as it serves as a instrument for campaigning politically, it is good to be a Christian. But if somebody holds to traditional values that looks down upon having children out of wedlock, bearing in mind three out of four Afro-American children nearly are born out of wedlock, well, that becomes racist, that becomes bigoted, even though they're simply upholding the traditional Afro-American faith-based Christian family values uh, that gave rise to civil rights, now that's become bad. It's what Isaiah said, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Something else has happened, however, that is equally disgraceful on the other side. It began with Jerry Falwell and his moral majority and his backing of Ronald Reagan, but had a prelude with Billy Graham essentially endorsing Richard Nixon. Uh, <clears throat> this identification of the religious right with the Republican Party, which was utterly hypocritical. It was Jerry Falwell who embraced an antichrist, the man who said he was the return of Christ, Sun Young Moon, and called him an unsung hero, taking $2.3 million from him. This is what Jerry Falwell did. It became worse than this. During the Watergate scandals, Billy Graham found himself in trouble because he had endorsed Nixon, who turned out to be a vehement anti-Semite, with Billy Graham himself making notoriously anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish statements that were later publicly disclosed. I do not blame his son Franklin for this, however. His son Franklin, who I tend to like and respect, had nothing to do with it. Nonetheless, this was the religious right. This myth that somehow the Republican Party was the party of Christian conservative family values. It is a notorious, notorious lie. Let's look at what really took place in the religious sphere. It was the Republican Earl Warren Supreme Court of Eisenhower that banned God from the classroom outlawing school prayer. That was Republican from Republican. It was the Republican Warren Burger Supreme Court that banned God from the maternity ward and brought in Roe versus Wade. The same Supreme Court that dehumanized blacks and said blacks were less than humans in the 19th century, in the 20th century, said fetuses were less than humans, even though they were being aborted at a fetal age where they could survive. That was Republicans. The Republicans ordered God out of the classroom. The Republicans ordered God out of the maternity ward. And then Ronald Reagan came along and lied. Ronald Reagan lied to evangelical America saying he was pro-life, did nothing pro-life, but he did something pro-death. He appointed Sandra Day O'Connor, a pro-abortion judge to the Supreme Court. Reagan openly, openly lied. Said one thing, did another. It was Sandra Day O'Connor who wrote the court's decision outlawing the Ten Commandments from the Judicial Building in Alabama, and it was also her who was responsible for the court's decision outlawing the Texas anti-sodomy laws that opened the door to same-sex marriage. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. That is your true legacy. That is what he did. These are the Republicans. So the Democrats embraced this liberal progressivist agenda that took on the ideas of liberation theology. It had African versions with Desmond Tutu in South Africa. It had a Catholic version with Sobrino and Bonino in, in Latin America in, in, in the Medellin Conference. But it had its American version very much. So you had a distortion of Christianity by the left or by the left center, by the Democrats, by the progressivists. But then you also have this hypocritical distortion by the Republicans on the so-called make-believe rights. It became worse than this. As long as somebody's political views were in tune with yours, they were given a moral license to live immorally or do things the scripture says was wrong. For instance, as one example on the left, Jesse Jackson took money donated by corporations and by foundations to the Rainbow Coalition, 
donated to help urban blacks in the inner cities and help urban black youth particularly. And he took this money and he paid a salubrious salary to the mother of a child born out of wedlock whom he impregnated to keep her quiet about the fact that he fathered a child out of wedlock. Now with three out of four children in the black community born out of wedlock, that's their leader, that's their role model. He was a Baptist minister, a clergyman. According to what St. Paul writes in Timothy and Titus, he had no biblical right to remain in the ministry. Oh, but he repented that he would accept the consequences of his actions. But he didn't. Oh, but that's okay. He's still a good brother because his politics are right. Well, the same thing happens on the political right. What Jerry Falwell did with a self-avowed antichrist who said his wife was the Holy Spirit, Sun Young Moon, a cult leader. Or what happens with people who are divorced and remarried and, and, and unscripturally on the political right and nobody says a word about it because the politics are right. Oh, that's okay. He's a good brother. No, he is not. This politicization, politicization of the church on both the left and the right, among, among both those given over to a liberation theology and those who are given over to a more conservative, supposedly evangelical theology has been bogus on both fronts. Now this in no way invalidates, no way invalidates the Judeo-Christian principles upon which the nation was founded, but it doesn't validate the misuse of religion for political purposes on both the left and the right, by both the Democrats and by the Republicans. Both of them are hypocrites. Both political parties have been hypocritical, and they have found hypocritical elements within the religious establishment to accommodate the hypocrisy, all with the political aim and agenda. That is the state of affairs. Now, let's go beyond this. There are issues which I am an evangelical and concerned. When the citizens of California voted in support of same sex marriage, Rick Warren supported Proposition 8, and then was actually publicly recorded, filmed lying, saying he never supported it. The election's coming up just in a couple weeks, and uh, I hope you're praying about your vote. Uh, one of the propositions, of course, that I want to mention is Proposition 8, which is the proposition that had to be uh, uh, instituted because the courts threw out the will of the people. And a, a court of uh, four guys uh, actually voted to change a definition of, Christ of, uh, of marriage that has been going for 5,000 years. Now, let me just say this really clearly. Uh, we support Proposition 8. And if you believe what the Bible says about marriage, you need to support Proposition 8. I never support a candidate, but on moral issues, I come out very clear. I, I never campaigned for it. I, this is one thing, friends, that at all politicians tend to agree on. Both Barack Obama and John McCain, I flat out asked both of them, what is your definition of marriage? And they both said the same thing. It is the traditional, historic, universal definition of marriage. One man and one woman for life. And every culture for 5,000 years and every religion for 5,000 years has, has uh, said the definition of marriage is uh, between one man and a woman. Now, here's an interesting thing. Just there, there are about 2% uh, of Americans are homosexual or gay, lesbian people. We should not let 2% of the population uh, determine uh, uh, to change a definition of marriage that has been supported by every single culture and every single religion for 5,000 years. This is not even just a Christian issue. It's a human, humanitarian and human issue. Therefore, criticize or not comment on the Iowa court decision to permit gay marriage. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally uh, uh, oblivious to, to uh, what's that. That's not even my agenda. I was asked a question that made it sound like I equated uh, gay marriage with pedophilia or uh, incest, which I absolutely do not believe. What we do know is this. The democratic will of the people of California was outlawed by a judge who le legislated from the bench. 
a federal court judge who was a homosexual himself, who should have recused himself but didn't. That judge was nominated to the bench by Ronald Reagan and appointed to the bench by George Bush. Again, this is the Republican Party that made Proposition 8 go away and opened the door, in fact, enforcing same-sex marriage. Do not trust the Republican Party to pursue any kind of traditional conservative Christian or evangelical values. They're just politicians the same as the Democrats. They use religion as a political stage to advance their own electoral interests. That's all. You cannot trust, believe, or respect any of them. Those who are pro-same-sex marriage and so forth are always yelling homophobia, when in fact they are heterophobia. They redefine tolerance as not that you'd be willing to tolerate their views or their lifestyle, but that you give a sense to it, that you sanction it as right, moral, and normal. And if you don't, you're a homophobe. Well, they are heterophobes. I'm concerned about that issue. I'm concerned about the genocidal atrocity of non-therapeutic abortion in which Ronald Reagan knifed us in the back. Not that I ever expected him to do anything else. I'm concerned about America turning against Israel and the damage done to Israel, betraying Israel to Islamic extremism. The Saudi Arabian Wahhab, who persecutes Christians and who funded Islamic radicalism that engenders terror and support for terror, carried the Bush dynasty around in their back pocket. These are Republicans. The way Obama has betrayed Israel and I would say the interest of America to Iranian sponsored Islamic terror. I'm concerned about these things as a Christian. The persecution of Christians in the Middle East, the rights of Christians. I'm concerned about abortion. I'm concerned about Israel. I'm concerned about the increased pressure on Christians to succumb to a homosexual agenda contrary to their moral values, where people are being forced to close down their bakery and pay huge fines because it's against their conscious and religious convictions to make cakes for same-sex weddings. This is a shame and a disgrace, and I'm concerned about it. My hope and my prayer is that Mr. Trump will do what is morally right, just as Mr. Reagan and Mr. Clinton and Mr. Obama did what was morally wrong. I hope so. I do believe Mike Pence is a true believer, and it is my prayer that he will have a positive influence for Christ and for Judeo-Christian values on Mr. Trump. I am praying for him, though I have no confidence in any politician, I certainly pray for whoever gets elected, and I'm praying for Mr. Trump. Because of her pro-abortion policies alone, I thank God Hillary Clinton was not elected. I thank God she was not elected. I consider her to be a wicked woman, in, in effect, morally tant tantamount to a murderess. Mr. Trump outspokenly opposed, certainly, late-term abortion. Again, I hope God keeps his hand on him, and I ur urge other Christians to pray for him. But... What I just reviewed is something the New York Times has no sense of. They don't understand the development of religion in the United States going back to the colonial period to the present time and its political parallel and the relationship between the two. We have to understand the relationship between the two. It goes back to the colonial period. It goes back to Roger Williams and Joseph Hooker. It goes to the Founders and framers of the Constitution and signatories of the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, <clears throat> and the Articles of Confederation. It comes forward to the period of abolition, ending slavery, and then the Civil Rights Movement. But now it comes forward even beyond that, to the present era. There has been hypocrisy on both the left and the right. There has been hypocrisy among evangelicals and among liberal Protestants, both. But it's not only Protestantism. 
much of the United States was originally settled by European powers who were Catholic. Florida was initially Catholic because of the Spanish. Certainly the Mississippi Valley, most of the Midwest and Louisiana by the French and the Southwest by the conquistadors such as Coronado. Colorado, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada. These were founded by Catholic empires from Europe as colonies of Europe that were later incorporated into the United States. There's always been a Catholic influence going back to the establishment of the state of Maryland, then the colony of Maryland, to give respite to Catholics being persecuted by the Puritans in England under Leonard Calvert. Now let's understand this further. The Roman Catholic Church is utterly morally discredited. Much the same as the televangelists have discredited popular evangelicism with their mammon worship and their money preaching. They have made the term born again into a household joke. They have called the sin of covetousness faith. Their real God is mammon. It's about money, con artistry. The disgusting money preaching of these people is unbelievable and is antithetical to the true message of Jesus. But what happened in Roman Catholicism with a widespread pedophilia where 177 out of 179 Roman Catholic dioceses in the United States were found culpable and liable for protecting pedophile sex criminal clergy at the expense of not protecting children. Nearly a billion dollars in out-of-court settlements and legal fees to keep Cardinal Mahoney alone out of jail. They had to get Cardinal Law from Boston out of the country virtually. I thank God that that film Spotlight won the Academy Award, told the truth. In Boston alone, 1,500 Roman Catholic priests caught and the hierarchy caught protecting them in league with the Vatican orchestrated conspiracy that operated internationally and is still operating internationally. The Roman Catholic Church has no moral credibility anymore among any thinking person, including Catholic people. Evangelicism has reached an all-time low because of the televangelists. And then there's the liberal Protestants. The only good thing about liberal Protestant churches is that they self-destruct. They have no product. As St. Paul wrote, they would one day come holding the form of religion but denying the power therein. Their churches are declining numerically. I look at the ridiculous folly of the, of the uh, <coughs> Presbyterian Church of America. That thing would have just dropped dead. It ought to just drop dead. One is worse than the other. This is the state of religion in America, if you want to use the term religion. That is not, however, to deny the validity of the original biblical Judeo-Christian principles upon which American democracy and American society was initially established. My only hope or prayer <coughs> is that the judgment of God can be delayed by a return to the faith of our fathers that happened during the great revivals of people like Jonathan Edwards or D.L. Moody and Harry Ironside, revivals that we had in time past. In black America, even if we correct the corrupt school system that has so failed our youth, particularly a minority, even if we correct it, it will not rectify the mess that black America is in being devoid of any future. With three out of four black children being born out of wedlock, they're statistically predisposed to dropping out of school and to winding up in the criminal justice system. The only hope is a return to Christ. In the tradition of the Pentecostalism and Baptist beliefs that were scripturally based, held by their grandparents and great-grandparents, that gave rise to abolition and that gave rise to civil rights. There'll be no effective upward mobility unless there is a moral restoration of black America.
But it's not just black America. They're just the most pressing example. It's America in general. We've turned away from the faith that gave us these things. Again, the founding fathers were not perfect men. Many were masons, many owned slaves. There was a lot of hypocrisy even from the beginning, and I'm not saying otherwise. Nonetheless, the Judeo-Christian biblical principles were not hypocritical. They did work, and they do work. And if this nation, the United States I'm speaking to, turns back to Christ, they can work again. Even though we've gone beyond the point of no return and the judgment of God must come because of non-therapeutic abortion, I'm convinced his judgment can tarry. I'd like to believe the election of Mr. Trump in this country and Brexit in Britain is God showing mercy to the English-speaking democracies. I'd like very much to believe that. And I would urge people to pray along those lines. These are things that many Christians don't understand. These are things that many practicing Protestants, Catholics, and even Eastern Orthodox people do not understand. These are things that many Jews do not understand. Now, if Christians don't understand these things, what do I expect from the New York Times, who don't care about God, who don't care about the religious values of people in middle America, who don't care about the Judeo-Christian heritage of the country? I don't expect Dean Bagwit to understand these things. But I do expect Christians to understand them. This is the reality. My name is Jacob Prash. Please pray for the new president and his administration and for Vice President Pence, who I believe is a true Christian. God bless and thank you. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But... In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast. Shadows of the beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.